Hi guys, it's Crystal. I hope you guys are all doing well today and that you're having a good week. I know we had some of the white stuff earlier this week, but hopefully that'll be the last bit of snow and spring will be on the way. Um, if you're new to my channel, guys, like I said, my name is Crystal and I do Canadian true crime or true crime with a Canadian twist. From time to time, I do talk about other nationalities just so that um, we can compare crimes and some of the stories from other nationalities are very, very interesting. Just that way I can inform you. So if that sounds like something that you guys want to learn about, please, please, please hit the like button, hit that old subscribe button. Hopefully uh, hit the notification bell. It may work, it may not. <laughs> and leave me some comments if you guys do choose to leave comments though please no hate there's enough hate out there in the world already and we're just here to talk about different things some of my theories are different than yours and vice versa sometimes you guys have more information than i had um i always love to learn new things if you guys are returning subscribers you guys already know how much i love you and how thankful i am that you guys choose to let me come into your living rooms um I know it seems like I took a week off. It's just because I've had uh, problems uploading this week, guys. So you may end up getting two videos this week. Hopefully it works out for me. I didn't take a break, trust me. Um, I just had some uploading problems. So hopefully they're fixed now. Um, these videos are for entertainment purposes or educational purposes only. And before we get into it today, guys, and there's a lot to go through today, so I'm probably gonna be talking pretty fast. Um, graphic trigger warnings in this video um a lot of rape rape of young girls um beatings torture things like that so if that bothers you or if that triggers you in any way these may not be the series of videos that you guys want to watch um i just want to put that out there so we're just going to get right into it guys um there's not a lot of stats or anything like there usually is um bernardo and Hamoka. So where we left off, they had just murdered Tammy Lynn. Inadvertently, but they had. It was a mixture of Halothane and Halcyon that her own sister provided the 15-year-old with. Um, of course, Tammy didn't know. They had laced her drinks with the um, Halcyon, and then Carla had held a rag soaked with Halothane over her face basically which actually left a chemical burn on her face um but it wasn't administered properly she didn't mix it with oxygen like she's supposed to and she also gave it to her sister on a full stomach um after she had drank a lot of booze there were questions but they weren't from the police officers the police did a very perfunctory type of investigation and they seemed satisfied that it was an accident the coroner himself didn't think it was an accident he had a lot of questions about that raspberry stain on Tammy Lynn's face but regardless the case was closed and it was accidental according to them so Tammy Lynn was actually buried five days before her 16th birthday December 27th of 1990 she would be 16 New Year's Day of 1991 but she of course um didn't make it there and when they buried her paul and carla had the audacity to leave a lot of little trinkets in her coffin they're responsible for her death and they in no way left her an apology letter letter or anything like that they did leave a letter um it was elusive really um there was nothing about their own guilt in it because paul and carla did not feel remorse or guilt over what had transpired of course carla had given tammy lynn because she was a virgin over to paul bernardo because that's what he wanted that's what she gave him for christmas um they left a man's gold ring they left um, a gold necklace that carla had been wearing while she was assaulting her sister they left that in there um, they left a letter, like I said, and they left a bunch of mementos from their upcoming wedding because remember, they're supposed to be getting married in June of 1991. Um, so the Homokas were having a hard time at this point in time. Um, and they did feel like Paul was there for them because Paul was unwilling to leave Carla alone for any length of time with her family or anybody else. Um, he was very nervous about being that. He was always hovering around at this point in time because he was afraid that Carla 
would spill the beans to somebody, not realizing that Carla would never do that because that would implicate her. And she was just as self-serving as he was. So she didn't want to do that. So <clears throat> sorry, guys, I'm sorry. This is hard to believe. So they killed Tammy Lynn the night of December, sorry, the early morning hours of December 24th, 1990. And by January 12th, they decided that they wanted to drug and rape another girl. Um, Carl and Dorothy Homoka were going to a lighting show at this point in time for his business. And uh, I, I feel like they did this every year, but they particularly needed it this year. They just needed to get away for a little bit after all the, the uh, trauma they had been through. And Lori was going to visit her grandparents this weekend. So Paul and Carla decided that weekend was the best weekend to go. Paul went out, selected somebody, abducted them and brought them back to the Homoka home where he then raped her downstairs. I believe it was in the basement. Well, Carla filmed the whole thing and watched. Carla was upset because she wasn't getting to have any fun. And it wasn't as fun for Paul because this girl wasn't like yelling and screaming the way he wanted her to. Remember, Paul needs to hear somebody be in pain and scream out at certain times when he rapes them. Um... They also decided to make a super disturbing video. I think it was actually more than one video uh, this weekend, which featured Carly, Carla as Tammy Lynn. This was technically her idea. She brought Tammy Lynn back to life for Paul. She like would wear her hair in front of her face. At one point in time, she had a picture of her sister over her face. She played the role of Tammy Lynn. She dressed like Tammy Lynn. They did this in Tammy's bedroom and they talked about the whole thing about how like he loved her and uh, Carla as Tammy Lynn kept saying like how much she loved it when he broke her hymen and things of that nature. They enacted the whole thing. At one point in time, Carla took a rose and stroked his like nether regions with it and said that they were then going to put it on Tammy, Tammy Lynn's grave the next day because it had touched intimate parts of Paul. Um, she also alluded to the fact that they should kidnap more girls. And this was really interesting to Paul because whenever Paul seemed to lose interest with Carla or vice versa, the other would do something to draw that person back in. And Carla was always full of these ideas. She took a pair of her sister's peach panties and pleasured Paul with them. Um, she lied to the cops and said that didn't happen, even though it did and they had it on videotape. Um, she enacted as, like, she made herself become her sister. She, she told him that they should uh, kidnap at least 50 sex slaves. And when he asked why, she was like, well, you're the king and you deserve it. And you deserve every virgin. And I want to do this for you because it makes you happy. And because I love you so much, I'm willing to do this for you. Um, they figured that, or she said 13 would be the best age to select these girls because they were more likely to be virgins then. They actually put this on tape. <clears throat> Now, the Homokas had been appreciative of Paul, but at this point in time, they wanted to grieve more as a family together. And Dorothy and Lori were particularly vocal about this. They wanted Paul to not be around so much. They kind of felt like he was an interloper. Part of the family, but not part of the core family, so to speak. And they were insistent that he not be around so much. Particularly Lori, actually, at this point in time. Because she blamed the two of them for Tammy's death. And rightly so. But she blamed the two of them because she thought they had just given her too much alcohol. Um, specifically since Lori had told them not to. So she was quite upset at this point in time as well. And Carla and Paul decided to rectify their situation by moving out on their own because if Paul couldn't stay with Carla then Carla would go with Paul and of course obviously the Bernardo house was out was out of was out of the realm of where they could stay because Paul was pretty much estranged from his parents at this point in time they there was no way they were going to be staying there 
besides it was dirty and disgusting and everything too. So I do want you guys to know though, so of course, obviously 1991, very busy time for Carla. She's preparing for her lavish upcoming nuptials. Uh, they were getting married at Niagara on the Niagara on the Lake or the Niagara Inn. I'm sorry, guys. Niagara on the Lake. It was one of the, um, the biggest, fanciest places in Canada. Um, a member of the Bronfman family, which is actually one of the world's richest family, but is a Canadian family, was married there. So they figure if they got married in this huge, lavish affair, then they would look more upper class and they would look um, better off to everybody if they did this. It would look like they were more important than other people. And remember, looks are everything to Paul Bernardo, but they're also everything to Carla as well. So she threw herself right into planning this wedding. It almost seems like she didn't even think about her sister. And Dorothy and Carl were also having problems with this. They had just paid for their daughter's funeral. And money seems to be an odd topic with the Homokas. Sometimes they claim they're broke. Sometimes they claim they found money. I, regardless, they had just buried one of their daughters. So they didn't necessarily feel that they'd be able to... Um, feel as much or put out as much feeling on that day because they had just it would only be six months away from when their youngest daughter died so they were asking them to postpone the wedding and of course Carla and Paul would hear nothing of this no 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 they asked them to cut back on the costs oh no they couldn't do this none of this thing so Carla was very much butting heads with her parents at this point in time and Paul was too but more from the background he filed this all away in his head to be used later on so, of course, at this point in time, Paul was actively beating Carla as well. Uh, he was mad. He was very mad that Tammy Lynn, the object of his affection, the object of his fixation at this point in time, had died because of Carla's stupid drugs. So he was very mad at Carla and she wanted to do things to get back into his good book. Um, hence allowing him to bring home the January girl and things of that nature. Um, like I said before, they had that weird dynamic where when one of them would start to pull away, particularly Paul, when he started to get bored of Carla, um, she would do just these outrageous things that made him intrigued all over again, like pretending to be Tammy in a video or like kidnapping the January girl. And she always had a prescription for the Halcyon. I just wanted to let you guys know too. And she would always be filling it, let's just say. So there's, their solution to the problem of having to have a place to live at was to go out and rent a place together. Ostensibly, it made sense because the two of them were going to be married soon anyway. Um, they managed to rent a place um, 57 Bayview Drive, of course, which was in Port Dalhousie. Now, Port Dalhousie is actually a suburb of St. Catharines, guys. It's about 10 minutes away from the, the center of St. Catharines. Um, it's got, uh, it's well-known claim to fame is that it's home to a lot of waterfront districts, like a, um, uh, sorry, I'm really having problems today. A lot of waterfront homes, and that particularly appealed to Paul. He wanted a home on the water. Um, for Carla, it had everything. It was modern. It was updated. It was, you know, in beiges and taupes and whites and creams. It was sophisticated. It was a pink clapboard house. It was a couple stories. There was a basement. It was everything the two had ever dreamt of. So they signed the lease for it. Now, the homeowners only checked Carla's credit at this point in time. Oddly enough, Carla was only working, you know, she was working full time, but only for, you know, regular salary. <laughs> it was minimum wage at this point in time. Um, she might've been working full time, but it was for minimum wage. At the Martindale Animal Clinic, she was still working there. And Paul himself was unemployed. Remember, uh, he had quit his job at uh, Goldfarb um, and Patel and Company. Um, he'd quit his job there. He, I think his unemployment had run out by this point in time. And his main source of income was smuggling cigarettes. True, it was very lucrative for him. He was making a lot of money. But they never checked into Paul at all. They only checked into Carla. Everything came up roses. Everything looked good. So they rented the house to them. And on uh, January 30th of 1991, the couple moved in to 57 Bayview Drive. 
Um, the rent itself was $1,150 a month, guys. And for that's a lot for 1991. But Paul had no problem clearing it. So everything worked out. The homeowners were happy that they found this lovely, attractive young couple to rent it. And Paul and Carla were happy because they got to be together and could watch the other. Um... Of course, another thing that they were doing at this point in time was Carla was writing to a lot of her friends specifically about the wedding. And in all the letters, she was always full of love and praise for Paul and everything he had done and how much she was grateful for him. But she was always disparaging her parents in these letters, um, saying that they were a-holes, you know, saying they were selfish, things of that nature, because they didn't want to give her this lavish wedding so soon after their youngest had died. She would like allude to the fact that they liked Tammy more than her and that they should just throw her this wedding because she could die at any point in time. And, you know, then what would her parents do? So she felt like she was entitled to this wedding. And she often disparaged her parents, you know, pretty relentlessly in these in these letters she wrote to her friends. Uh, Paul, um, Paul also joined the Freemasons at this point in time. Carla had a friend who was in the Freemasons. He was able to get Paul into this. To Paul, this was everything, right? This was normalcy. This is what upper class men did. This gave him a sense of belonging to a society. And it worked out really well for him. Um, he was particularly intrigued by the fact that Freemasons pride themselves on secrecy and rituals, right? And Carla was equally intrigued with this because the Freemasons have roots in the occult. And Carla was still deeply into the occult at this point in time. And also, you know, her various thoughts of death and, and you know, things of that nature so in early 1991 I'm laughing because of the ludicrousness of this guys it's mm. in 1991 Paul decided that his next career choice should be that he became a rapper Vanilla Ice was huge right 1990 1991 and Paul thought he could be the next Vanilla Ice so he started to wear his hair like Vanilla Ice did. He always wanted to have those Baywatch looks, right? The sun-streaked hair, the blue eyes, and the great physique. Remember, looks are everything to Paul Bernardo. So he started to kind of fashion himself <laughs> as a rapper, so to speak. And uh, he, you know, tipped the hair with blonde and everything like that. Uh, he wrote his own lyrics um, at the house on 57 Bayview Drive. He had a music room with soundboards and his lyric books and, you know, all these posters up. And uh, he told everybody he was going to be the next big thing. I believe he called himself Young Hype. And one of his songs was I'm a Deadly Innocent Guy. Just putting that out there, guys. So... That was his next big career move. And he started to surround himself with even younger people at this point in time. Um, just because, you know, he's a he's almost 27 and he feels like he's going to be a rapper. And these other 27-year-olds wouldn't believe him, so to speak. But these younger guys did. And they hung on his every word. Um, Paul and his friends went down to Florida like they did every year in March of that year. And he actually met a girl. I think she was slightly older than him. Her name was Allison and she worked as a nurse and Paul and Allison were instantly intrigued with each other. Of course, they went to bed immediately just like him and Carla, but Allison liked anal sex and you know, that's a big thing for Paul Bernardo. In fact, she's the only girl he ever knew that had asked for it. Suddenly he was torn between her and Carla. Uh, he went home and he told Carla all about her, just like he always did with all of his rapes or all of the people he stalked or all the people that he peeped with. He always told Carla about them. And Carla started to get really nervous. She knew she'd have to do something really big to stop Paul from fixating so much on Allison. It wasn't that she was mad that he had another girlfriend because um, she'd pretend to be Paul's sister on the phone when Allison called. Um, it was more that she was afraid that he would take his love away from her that she was afraid that he was falling for this Allison girl. So she had to do something big to keep him. Oddly enough, at this point in time, actually Paul did something nice for Carla. Um, he bought her a dog. She had always wanted a puppy um, and Paul had said he was allergic to them, but he did buy her a little Rottweiler puppy. Uh, his name was Buddy. And they were actually good to the animal. Um, there weren't a whole lot of instances, except for one, that I ever read that Paul did anything to animals to. He doesn't seem like, he he never, he didn't have the homicide triad, guys. He never 
had the bed wetting patch age appropriateness or medical means. He was never a fire starter and he didn't appear to abuse animals that I could I could read. So, I mean, I think for Paul though, getting this um getting this dog was also more about how he looked. Um because it kind of you know, you've got the house, you've got the fiance, you have a puppy, you have this nice normal life, you look like you have it all. So I think that was the draw for Paul with regard to buying the dog for Carla. So he was so happy with how his life was going that in April of 1991, he went out and raped again. This time it was in the St. Catharines area. Um, it's a place called Henley Island, which I believe is right in Port Dalhousie, actually. Um, she was a 14 year old girl and she was a rower um, for the row team. And it was not an ideal rape by any means. There was no script. He didn't get to do all of his various sex acts. He didn't get to take as long as he wanted to because it was early in the morning, actually, when he did this. And there were a number of people that were in the area. He could hear them. But he did manage to rape her vaginally. He managed to rape her anally. And he actually stole her her shell. They call it a rowing shell. He actually stole that. I believe it's like a nylon jacket, guys, but it's sleeveless. It reminds me of the pennies we used to wear in gym class. Remember like those? Yeah. It reminds me of that. So he actually stole it and he was super happy when he came home and told Carla. They ended up burning the shell, but he was like beyond excited. He, he had to tell Carla everything. He was so, it was almost like Carla was his best friend at this point in time as well. He was beating the crap out of her all the time, but it was almost like she was also his best friend and sounding board at this point in time because she was the only other one that knew what he was like. Now, Carla was still writing her notes to Paul. Um, she sent him a bevy, but a lot of these notes alluded to the fact that they were fighting a lot, particularly about the fact that Tammy Lynn had died um, and that Paul was really upset with that. Um, she would make little things like, oh, you know, we used to be an unbeatable team, you and I. We can have that again. You just have to forgive me and I'm so sorry and things like that. So she did appear to apologize profusely for everything, although she did kill her sister. So it's there's always that duality with Carla. Yes, I believe she really did love Paul. I don't think Paul could love anything. I think she was just fascinating to him. Um, and she wanted to keep him at all costs. So, like I said, she had to do something pretty spectacular to beat out this Allison woman. So she decided that they were going to put down another girl again using the Halcyon and Halothane. They'd failed with Tammy, but this time they weren't going to fail. Carla said, told Paul she knew exactly what went on. Um, Tammy Lynn had eaten and uh, she had drank. And you know when you're supposed to have surgery and you're under anesthesia, you're not supposed to have anything to eat or drink for 12 hours. So she made sure that Jane, that wouldn't happen to her. She wouldn't do that. So Carla had actually known Jane for a number of years um, from when she was working at the number one pet clinic. Um, I believe that was in 1989. Uh, Jane was about 12 when they first met and she loved puppies and, and animals. And eventually Carla would give her odd jobs around the clinic to do. And they grew close. Um, well, in Jane's mind, they grew, grew close. Uh, Carla was like a big sister to Jane, really. And she loved Carla. She'd do anything for Carla. And she was super excited Carla had this dog. So when Carla, out of the blue, called her up and invited her to one of her wedding showers, but also called her up to hang out with her, Jane was beyond excited. Jane, guys, it's a pseudonym, right? Her name can't be revealed. And she was so excited to go over and they were just going to, you know, um, eat dinner, watch some movies, and then they'd um, have a sleepover. So her parents were a little concerned over the fact that that Carla seemed to have an interest in a girl that was so young. But maybe they chalked it up to the fact that she had just lost her own sister regardless. So Paul wasn't supposed to be there that night. Um, they did all the things that they did. And then of course, Carla drugged the drinks and Jane passed out. She called Paul and said, you got to come over here quick. I have a surprise for you. It was a wedding surprise for him, so to speak. So of course, <laughs> he found a comatose girl and both he and Carla raped this poor, unconscious, hapless 15-year-old girl and recorded everything for quite some time. Um, it was everything that Paul wanted and then some. Carla partook in it and she was a very, very happy participant. Um, these 
are the stills from a lot of the videos that show her being so happy. A lot of that is with Jane. Um, and the best thing about it was that Jane looked almost exactly like Tammy Lynn. She looked an awful lot like her. So it was like Carla was bringing Tammy Lynn back to life for Paul. He was beyond excited. So everything happened. And of course, she thought that the next day was when she met Paul. She didn't realize what happened the night before. Halcyon, Halothane, a side effect is you don't remember anything once you go under. And she had no idea that she'd been drugged ever at, at all until much later on. And uh, she thought she was meeting Paul the next day. They dropped her off. And as they were dropping her, after they had dropped her off, Paul punched Carla a few times because he was so pissed off that that it wasn't Tammy, that this, this, that, that the drugging hadn't worked with Tammy, but it had with Jane. Why did Tammy have to die? Jane lived. I don't understand. So he beat her. So Leslie Aaron Mahaffey. I'm just going to bring up a picture here, guys. Maybe if my computer wants to cooperate. So this is the best picture I can find of her. I really hope, guys, that it's not too uh, too grainy. So that's Leslie Mahaffey. Leslie Aaron Mahaffey was born July 1st of 1976. She was actually a miracle baby um, for her parents, uh, Deborah and Dan Mahaffey. Uh, sorry, Mahaffey. Um, Deborah had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer and was getting treatments for it when she became pregnant for Leslie and as she was carrying Leslie. And the doctors told her about the risks, about how it could be dangerous for her, um, that the baby could be born with deformities or not be born at all. So they suggested she abort Leslie, but Deborah wouldn't hear anything of it. And she carried Leslie to term and Leslie was born a perfectly happy, healthy baby. Um, she was a delight to her parents. Um, I know she has a younger brother named Ryan. He was born quite a few years after her and the family loved each other and cared a lot about each other. In fact, Leslie was particularly devoted to her brother, Ryan. She loved him very much, but Leslie at this point in time was 14 years old. She was about a couple weeks from from being 15 you know she she was starting to rebel guys um she'd been having problems in school particularly since she'd been skipping a lot her grades were not very good um she had been she had shoplifted she'd been arrested for that um she had also run away a couple times. Um, she was just bristling at the rules and they were just normal rules about curfew and about going to bed at this point in time and about being in school, you know, every day. And she was just rebelling. That was all. It was normal teenage rebellion, guys. She had run away for a couple, uh, twice. And the one time she had stayed away for about 10 days. Um, however, every night she called her parents Yes, she did party during these 12 days. She had a boyfriend. His name was Grant. And yes, she did party during these 12 days at a motel, I believe she and her friends stayed at. But it wasn't anything as untoward as what people would think. And like I said, she called home every night. Her parents knew where she was. Well, her parents heard from her every night. And, um, she finally decided she wanted to come home. And at this particular point in time, Leslie was doing better. She had gone to counseling and she started to feel better about the situation at home. Um, she'd gone to counseling. She'd talked everything out. You know, her parents were willing to make some concessions. She was willing to make some concessions. Um, she was, she wanted to do better at school. She kind of knew that this year was, was going to be a tough one. Um, she wanted to get her life back on track. Um, she made a couple mistakes. That's all. She was 14 years old at this guy time, guys. That was it. It was just a few mistakes. But regardless. Um, Leslie, of course, from what you've seen, had long blonde hair. She wore braces at this point in time. She had pierced ears and she had blue eyes. And um, she was a normal teenager. She had a lot of friends. She was fairly popular. A lot of people seemed to like Leslie. She seemed like a really good person, guys. Um... June 14th of 1991. 
Leslie had a good friend. His name was Chris Evans. And a couple days prior to June 14th, um, Chris Evans had actually died. There had been a very fiery car crash. The car was going very, very fast. It was driven by a teenage driver. There were six occupants in the car and four of the six occupants died that night. Chris was one of them. So she had gone to his wake and then she and the rest of the teenagers that knew Chris and that knew the people that were in the car decided to throw kind of an impromptu second wake, if you will, at, at a, a popular party place. They were doing this to remember their friends. Um, people remember that night that Leslie was like a social butterfly. Um, she was talking, you know, to various groups. She was having fun. She was dancing. She was laughing. She drank a couple beers, nothing, nothing too much, but she missed her 1130 curfew. She had a curfew of 1130 that night and she missed it. By the time she checked her watch and saw that she had missed it, she was like, well, I've blown curfew already. What's another few minutes? So she did not leave the party, um, at the rock until about 1230. Um, she was walked home by one of her guy friends. Uh, they talked for a few minutes. Um, he walked her to her backyard. She checked the back door and the front door, but they were both locked. That was the Mahaffey's way of kind of retaliating over the fact that their daughter was late. They figured she'd ring the, the bell and then they could give her proper hell, right? Leslie knew this though. And Leslie didn't want to ring the bell or knock on the door because she didn't feel like getting a lecture. She had just come back from a wake. She had just, she was going in a couple days to the funeral. I think it was either the next day or the day, the day after to Chris's funeral. She just really didn't want to hear about it at this point in time. Um, Her friend had to go home. He also had a curfew and it was getting late. Um, he didn't want to leave Leslie, but Leslie kind of made it seem, oh, I'll be okay. Okay. I'll be, I'll be fine. So he left, but he also figured that she would probably ring the bell or knock on the door and her parents would let her in. She didn't do that. She walked across to the 7-Eleven. Um, it wasn't that far away from where she lived um, and used the phone at the 7-Eleven to call one of her good friends. Um, she asked her good friend if she could sleep overnight there, and this friend said no. Um, Leslie and she had done this before, and um, Debbie Mahaffey didn't agree with it. I, I don't think they told Debbie where they were going, and then the next day the friend's mother dropped her off or phoned Debbie, and Debbie gave the friend's mother proper hell because she hadn't known where her daughter was. Um, she hadn't known that the woman, um, had picked her up, I think. So the, the friend could not agree to this. Plus her mother was already on her way to pick up, um, her sister. Uh, her sister had been at a sleepover and gotten sick. So it was already late at night. Um, the two of them talked for an hour, about half an hour, maybe a little bit longer. It was about 2 a.m. when they hung up. Leslie walked back to her backyard. She sat on the picnic table and she was having a cigarette when out of nowhere, a stranger appeared. Um, she didn't seem particularly nervous about him being there or anxious. She just asked him what he was doing there. And the stranger replied that he was casing the neighborhood for places to rob from. Um, he said that Leslie replied, cool. Um, she asked him for a cigarette and he led her to his car she was blowing the smoke out the window. He told her to bring her legs back in because he had a knife present and he kidnapped her. Of course, we know that this stranger was Paul Bernardo. He was actually in Burlington. That is where Leslie Mahaffey is from, is from Burlington. I don't think I mentioned that before, which is about half an hour away from Port Dalhousie. And he was in Burlington because he was stealing license plates. Um, of course, because he's smuggling all the time. He's making multiple trips through the border. And Border Patrol will take video uh, and snap pictures of your license plates as you come to and from Canada. If they think you're going, you're going over to war, um, if they think you're going over too often or if you seem suspicious at all, or if they figure you haven't declared everything at customs, they'll run your plates and then they can get your address that way and contact you that way. If Paul used stolen plates, the plates could never be traced back to him. They would only ever go to the original owners. So that's why he stole plates and he would just affix these plates across, you know, on so that nobody figured that the car was untoward. 
And that's what he had been doing in Burlington that night. Leslie's kidnapping was a crime of opportunity. He went through this backyard. 14-year-old girl happens to be there. She's pretty. I'm going to take her. And that's what he did. Um, she wasn't, uh, he also handed her a blindfold. I believe it was like a shirt of his um, that she tied around his eyes. So there is some indication that he meant to let her go or that, that he maybe wasn't immediately thinking of killing her. Um, I mean, she had already seen his face, but he did demand that she blindfold herself. And of course, he's beyond excited. He's going back home and he's got his slave and he's just so excited. When he got home, he did wake up Carla. He did tell her um, that they had company and she did know what was going on. And he basically said, you know, I'll call you when it's your turn. And she just went about her business. Um, of course, we know, guys, we know exactly what happened to Leslie for the most part. Because for 24 hours, they terrorized, raped, assaulted, and hit this girl, this 14-year-old girl, whose only crime was being late for curfew. I mean, how many of us have been late for curfew? And she paid with it for, she paid for it with her life. She really did. Um, Paul raped her in various ways. She had a script she had to follow. Carla also raped her. And from every video, guys, Carla appeared that she loved, like she she appeared to love what was going on. She was always a very active participant and a very willing participant. Um, Leslie was terrified. She kept begging to see her brother. Um, he, Paul would go like, oh, oh yeah, when you go home or, or if we let you go, you know, Leslie, you have to perform really, really well for us. You going home depends on, on your performance. So they led her to believe she was going to go home. And she, she pleaded with them to let her see her family again, her brother again, all with the, you know, the, the, um, blindfold was always on. They performed her going to the washroom, having baths, doing everything. It was, it, it, in every way, very disgusting. There were very traumatic even reading it guys it was it's very very traumatic um like i said they kept her for 24 hours um carla knew they had to get rid of her before the 15th because the 15th was actually father's day and uh dorothy and carl were coming over to 57 bayview drive they had made up somewhat at that point in time um for dinner so Paul was very excited. He was very happy. And like I said, Leslie was very compliant. She did everything they asked her to. Everything. Because she thought she'd have a hope of going home. Sadly, at some point in time within the 24 hours, Paul and Carla decided she had to go. They couldn't be certain. She didn't remember where she was. She couldn't be certain that she didn't remember Paul's face. It was too much of a liability. So she had to go. Now, Leslie's death can be debated, how she actually died. Um, according to Carla's account, Paul strangled her in the bedroom close to the hope chest with an electrical cord. Um, he strangled her for several minutes. They thought she was dead. And then the body made um, some type of gurgling sound or some type of sound. Um, so Paul took the black electrical cord, used his foot for leverage guys see even now when I'm twisting my foot using his foot for leverage he then choked the very life out of her that is Carla's account that is the account the account that most people believe according to Paul it was Carla who killed Leslie of course they're blaming each other we'll never know the full story however when they did the second autopsy on Leslie Mahaffey um when they they we're pretty sure that um, her murder was linked to Kristen's. Um, there wasn't a lot of bruising on Leslie, uh, not as much as with Kristen. He, you know, Kristen really had, had she was beaten a lot. Um, Leslie was struck, um, particularly in the mouth. Uh, I know her braces had cut her, her lip, um, but she was more compliant, so he didn't have to beat her as much. Um, when they peeled back her skin on her back, there were two asymmetrical, so they weren't perfectly round, but there were two asymmetrical bruises, small, small asymmetrical bruises, about chest level, so about this level. Um, and they were equal distance 
on her body. Those were the only bruises that were there. Um, so if you're to believe Carla, then that would mean that Paul's foot, since they were horizontal, would have been like this, guys. And I don't know about you, but that's very hard. If I'm going, if, if, if I'm going to use my foot for leverage, I'm going to go like this. And I don't know how long I can hold that for. They said they were equal distance. One was not higher than the other. They were equal distance. They were just asymmetrical. Paul also had really large feet. So these wouldn't have been small bruises. The heel one might have, might have been small, but this part of the padded part of your foot would leave a much bigger and not circular bruise. Not, not really even circular at all bruise. It's almost, but these bruises could almost be the size of a, a smaller person's knees per se. A smaller person kneeling on the body to get leverage. I'm going to interject something here and say that it could have been possible. It could have been possible that Carla tried to strangle Leslie first and thought that she had done so, leaving those small bruises, right? The blood would still be circulating. Bruises can form. Um, the blood would, and so, you know, she maybe wasn't strong enough, so Paul had to finish Leslie off. I, I, I'm not entirely certain that Paul Bernardo killed Leslie, but it, Paul Bernardo himself, just Paul Bernardo. I'm not entirely uncertain that Carla didn't have some part in it. But I'm leaving that out there. That's up for you guys to decide. So, of course, on the 15th, Carl and, and uh, oh gosh, I forgot her name for a second. <laughs> Carl and Dorothy show up back at the house. And they had hidden Leslie's body in the um, in the cellar. They had cleaned everything up. They had vacuumed everything up. They knew everything. They knew a lot about um, forensics, so to speak, um, more about DNA than they had previously known. But they also knew about fiber analysis and everything else. They, I mean, Carla herself read a ton of true crime, so she knew some forensics. So they cleaned everything up. Um, there was only one odd part in the night. Um, they were acting very. Normally, there was only one odd part in the night when uh, Dorothy said um, that they, when they realized they didn't have enough potatoes and Dorothy said, oh, I'll go downstairs to the cellar to get them. Obviously, that's where they kept them. And Carla was like, no, no, mom, I'll do it. I'll do it. And she went down and got them because, of course, Leslie's body's there. If they had let Dorothy go down there, cover would have been blown. So then there's another part that's a little bit out there. The day after, the Monday, Carla says she went to work and it does appear that she went to work and that when she was at work and she knew what was going to happen, um, Paul erected like a plastic tent and dismembered Leslie's body. He cut her into 10 pieces um, and then he encased her in blocks of cement, eight blocks of cement. He used um, two of them. He doubled up the body parts for. Um, these were not poured particularly well, but that is how he figured he could get rid of even more possible fingerprints or DNA. It would be um, absorbed within the concrete in his, in his point of view. Carla says that she helped with the cleanup afterwards, um, getting rid of all the little bits and bones of skin or bits and bones and skin and, and the blood and unclogging drains, et cetera, et cetera. She said she helped him clean up afterwards. She said she never helped with the dismemberment and she didn't help with the concrete blocks. People do point out that Carla was um, used to surgeries. Um, she helped out at the animal shelter with them, right? At the animal clinic with them. So she kind of had a little bit more knowledge in that than let's say Paul Bergardo, who's never done anything before. So some people point out that maybe she was there during the dismemberment, but not during the concrete pouring. They feel as if she had been there with her attention to detail, the concrete would have been poured better. That's just another thing I'm going to put out there. So they were encased and Paul got rid of um, these, these, coffins these card these um concrete coffins he got rid of them in in a couple different spots he thought he had thrown them far enough that they they would never surface and the torso itself both he and Carla had to get rid of because it was about 200 pounds and two people couldn't do it on its own or on their own so when he or one person couldn't do it on their own so when uh they threw it off the bridge um it actually knocked 
the coffin apart and Leslie's torso came back up. Now, as for a police investigation into Leslie Mahaffey, there wasn't one. Um, when Dan and Debbie called the police and told them that their daughter was missing, they were told, well, your daughter's a runaway. She's probably just run away. <clears throat> Dan and Deborah knew at this point in time that that couldn't be true. Every other time that Leslie had run away, she had always called home afterward or she had always called home every day that she was gone. She never did this. Um, they had been getting along better with her. She had gone through counseling. You know, she was trying to get her life back on track. It made no sense because there was no real trouble other than the fact that she missed her curfew. There was no real other trouble in the family. It was very baffling and the family just, it didn't sit right with the family. They just knew that Leslie had not run away. Call it mother's instinct, right? The gut intuition, but they knew Leslie hadn't run away. Um, there was, but the police didn't seem to care. They had, they didn't seem to care at all until Leslie's body was actually found. Um, the media itself didn't report a lot about Leslie Mahaffey's disappearance. Um, it was only in the local newspaper and it was like way back in the pages. It wasn't front page news or anything. There was very little reporting done and there was very little investigative do work done in the time that Leslie Mahaffey was missing. So, oh my. In the days leading up to the wedding, because of course, ironically enough, Leslie's body was actually found June 29th of 1991, and that's Paul and Carla's wedding date. They didn't intend for it to happen, but it did happen. That's when fishermen found um, some of the concrete blocks, and then uh, they were also able to find the torso and called the police. It took the police a while to identify the body because she was dismembered, and the concrete had actually turned Leslie's blue eyes into brown. But as soon as Debbie heard that a body was found, she knew that it was more than likely her daughter. And of course it was verified. Um, it, the body was Leslie Mahaffey. So in the days leading up to the wedding, actually Paul did beat Carla. Um, people started to ask questions because people could see the bruises. They were mostly on the arms. He, he usually didn't beat her in the face because he didn't want to beat her in places where she wouldn't be able to go to work the next day. But she would like, I don't want to say she was flaunting these things, but unlike most people, she didn't try to cover them up. She would wear like sleeveless blouses. However, she always had a ready excuse. Like it was the animals at the clinic that bruised her up this badly or, you know, her own puppy buddy was roughhousing with her too much. So she always had a ready excuse, but he did actually beat her in the days leading up to the wedding and people were starting to question her about that. Um, she'd go on later to say that she had hoped somebody would stop the wedding, that, that she prayed that somebody would do something and intervene. But of course, nobody did because nobody knew anything was going on. Um, so then they went, uh, they went to, um, Hawaii for their honeymoon. They had about $9,000 from this huge lavish wedding. The reason they had so much money guys is they invited everybody they had ever met to this wedding in the hopes of getting a bunch of money. And that's exactly what happened. Wedding went off a hit without a hitch. They got married. Some people say that, that Carla just didn't look happy at the wedding. Other people say that she did. So it depends on who believes whom at this point in time. But the wedding went off without a hitch. Uh, they went on their honeymoon in Hawaii. They made many videos of it. You could actually hear Paul um, swearing at her in some of them, and he did beat her while they were on the Hawaii trip. A lot of the stuff Carla thought was boring. Um, she did make this lovely soliloquy to her husband during a sunset while he was in the shower about how much she loved him. Um, but regardless, when they got back, one of the souvenirs Paul brought, brought back with him was a newspaper clipping. It was just one from a paper in Maui. And it was all about how a woman was dragged off of a road and raped in Maui. It's a very odd souvenir to bring back. Um, it wasn't the whole entire newspaper, so it wasn't like he was bringing back a newspaper from, um, from the U.S. It was just this one article. I'm also just putting that out there. Is it possible that Paul raped somebody while they were in Maui? It's possible. So on July 22nd of 1991, this is just af shortly after they got home from there, 
um, honeymoon. Paul and Carla made a police report. They called police. Police came to the house. Um, and the couple claimed that their house had been broken into and that $30,000 worth of items were missing. Police were like, oh, we can believe Paul Bernardo. He's an accountant, so he should know the monetary worth of things. Luckily for Paul and Carla, though, Paul had taken out extra home insurance, home and content insurance, just before they went on their honeymoon, just before they got married. So, you know he could be able to recoup his losses. Uh, in August of 1991, Paul and Carla decided to put Jane down again. They, they were escalating, guys. They needed more entertainment. They needed more kinkier sex in order to keep um, excited with each other, in order to keep enamored with each other. This was actually a very big part of their lives. Um, they were enmeshed with this. They were intertwined with this. They had so many secrets at this point in time that they were they were bound. They were pretty bound to each other. Um, and this was one of their things. They were escalating, but they needed more excitement. They needed more thrill in order to feel that. So they decided to put Jane down under again. And this time things didn't go as, as they should have. Um, Carla didn't get the mixture right, again, like she had with Tammy. And Jane actually did stop breathing during some of the assaults. Um, they had to call 911, but uh, they were able to get her breathing again. So Carla just ha hung up. 911 never called them back and uh, no ambulance ever showed up. So nothing, nothing was really untoward in the minds of everybody else. Uh, Paul and Carla felt that they had dodged a bullet and, and Jane was okay. She was comatose for most of the night, but she was able to get up in the morning. <coughs> it was around this point in time that Jane started to come to her senses about what Paul and Carla were really like. Um, Paul and Carla were always trying to force themselves we're always trying to false force Paul on Jane. Um, Paul would often try to, you know, take her, buy her things, take her on trips, et cetera, et cetera. Jane would always, or sorry, Carla would always be telling Jane, um, that Paul would be the best part of his life, that Paul would do anything, you know, he'd be a really great guy for her. She was like pushing Paul towards Jane. Paul's what, 27 years old at this point in time. Jane is 15. And Jane did actually give him oral sex several times throughout um, that summer, but she didn't feel comfortable going any further. And she, of course, had no idea that she'd been drugged and raped. I don't think for a couple years later, I, I don't think she would know until the police found the videotapes. Um, so she didn't understand um, why they were doing this. And she started to kind of come to her senses and draw away. So by Christmas time of 1991, she was out of the picture. She had been becoming a good sex slave, but you know, then she was, you know, defiant in their words, I guess. So a couple different things happened in, uh, at the end of 1991. Uh, first of all, in December of 91, Debbie Bernardo, which is Paul's older sister, decided to file charges against Ken Bernardo for the molestation of both her and her daughter. Um, he had started molesting her four-year-old daughter. Um, Marilyn, her uh, Paul's mother, and David, Paul's brother, tried to talk her out of it, saying no good would come of it. Um, but she decided she cared too much about her kids and she went ahead with filing the charges. Um, Paul then raped his friend Van's girlfriend's friend. I'm sorry, I know that's a lot without me using names. Um, this would be Van Smearness had a girlfriend and this was one of her friends. They brought this friend to 57 Bayview Drive. Carla was home at this point in time. It was during a Christmas party and Paul raped her in a bathroom at that point in time. Uh, they also... So as for the investigation, of course, we, they knew that Leslie Mahaffey was dead. So... In regards to the investigation for that, police had a prime suspect. His name was John Peter Stark. Uh, John Peter Stark had actually been in prison for, at one point in time, for stabbing a hitchhiker he picked up in the 70s, a female hitchhiker he picked up in the 70s. And he was a suspect in the, the murder of his daughter's best friend. He also had a weird quirk where he used to like his wife to dress up as a schoolgirl 
go out to a desolate road or go out to a desolate place, pretend she was hitchhiking, he'd come along, pick her up, gave a false name, they'd drive to some, you know, industrial, like abandoned industrial area, and he would have violent sex with her. It was consensual, but he would have violent sex with her. Um, so police were watching him, and they thought he was good for the murder of Leslie Mahaffey at this point in time. They were really trying to tie the two of them together, particularly because they were, they knew he killed Julie Staunton, they were just ready for him. They, they just needed for him to make a confession or to get a little bit more information. So they were tailing him at this point in time. He was a murderer, but he wasn't their murderer. Um, Paul's DNA was actually one of the five samples resubmitted for further testing in the Scarborough rapes. Um, and this would be in April of 1992. Um Paul's name was also actually stricken from, sorry guys, the Institute of Chartered Accountants, I want to say it right, uh, that month as well. He hadn't paid his dues in forever uh, and he didn't really care because now he was going to be a rapper. He didn't need the accountancy program anymore. Uh, in April of 1992, Paul and Carla decided that they needed another thrill. They needed another excitement. They needed more excitement in their lives. They were getting a little bored. They needed another sex slave. And Paul said that this time Carla could pick her out. They decided that this would happen over Easter weekend of 1992. And April 16th of 1992 was a Thursday. So they went out on the hunt. Kristen Dawn French was 15 years old at that point in time. Uh, her birthday is actually May 10th of 1976. So she was only a couple weeks short of being 16. Uh, she had a long list of gifts that she wanted to talk about with her loyal boyfriend, Elton Wade. Um, the two had been dating for a while. Um, they were inseparable. They were very, very close. Um, Kristen was actually the fifth of the five French children. Uh, her parents' names were Doug and Donna French. Doug was a little bit older than Donna, and he'd had a, a previous first marriage. He had had a previous marriage, and he had children from that marriage. Uh, so they would be um, Kristen's uh, half-brothers and sisters. And I believe he and Donna had two children, so it would be Darren and Kristen. Uh, by now, the older children had already moved. The only children at home were Darren and Kristen. And Kristen was called Christy by her family and friends. Um, Kristen was about five foot five. She had luxurious, long brown hair that she uh, took very good care of. And it had been previously dyed. And, or sorry, it had been previously curled. She had just gotten a perm. It was big back then, guys. We did that. Well, they did that. I was, yeah, never mind. Uh, and she had uh, dark brown eyes. Uh, she had an infectious smile. Um, she was, one of her legs was actually shorter than the other one, guys. Um, and she had back problems because of it, because of they weren't equal. Um, so she actually wore shoes with um, a shoe, uh, specially made shoes. And one of them had an up uplift in it so that she would be um, equal in height. Um, she had been an avid rower for the row team, as well as an avid figure skater. But she'd kind of had to curtail those activities in the past few months um, due to the back pain. Uh, she was experiencing more of it at this point in time. Kristen was a super smart girl. She was very intelligent. She was a straight A student. She was an honor roll student. Um, she had a lot of friends. She was bubbly. She was genuinely a nice person. Nobody had anything bad to say about Kristen Dawn French. She was just a very genuinely good person. Um, on top of that, she was always very, she was also very responsible and routined. The most particular part of her routine was that every day she arrived home from school at the exact same time to let the family dog Sasha out of um, her pen so that she could be exercised and, and, and walked around and everything else. She loved the family dog. She was very, very, very routined with that. I just want you guys to know that. Chrissy was the kind of daughter and friend that everybody wished they'd had, guys. So I'm just going to show you a picture. Just one second.
sorry guys, it's just taking a couple seconds to load. So there's, there's Kristen French, guys. Hopefully you guys can see that without too much of a glare on it. So unfortunately for Kristen Dawn French, she was also the perfect victim for both Paul and Carla. She checked all the boxes. So Paul and Carla decided they were going to drive around and, and do what they could to lure someone in. So this is right in St. Catharines, actually. There's a church there called the Grace Lutheran Church. It was quite close to Kristen's school, um, which was Holy Cross. She went to a Catholic school. And um, Paul, of course, pulled in with his, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but he was now driving in 1989 gold Nissan 240 SX. Um, he'd gotten rid of the white Capri some point in time earlier because um, it was kind of linked to the Scarborough rapes. He kind of had to. So this is a gold Nissan 240 SX. Um, he pulled into the Grace Lutheran parking lot. Ostensibly, he and Carla were going to tell whichever schoolgirl at this point in time, it happened to be Kristen, um, that they were kidnapping, that they were lost. Um, they figured it would be better if Chris, if uh, Carla got out of the car because um, a girl would be more willing to help out another woman. And um, she had a map. Now, this map was actually a map of Scarborough, and she was just going to get Kristen to point out someplace. She was going to ask where Penn Center was. It was a big shopping mall. And she didn't realize she'd grabbed the wrong map, but it didn't really matter. So um, she pulled out the map. Kristen came over and Paul then quickly got out of his car and went around and had the knife. There was a bit of a struggle in which the map was torn. They cut off a lock of Kristen's hair by accident with the knife. And she also lost one of her shoes. There was a woman who kind of witnessed it, but not really. She didn't actually witness the actual abduction. She just saw the three of them together. And she was the one that was able to describe the car to the police. She said that she thought the car looked like a Camaro. It had headlights like a Camaro did, um, an older model Camaro. And at this point in time, police jumped on the fact well, the fact that it was a Camaro. They deeply believed it was a Camaro. Um, this would lead to a number of missteps later on. But the woman never said it was a Camaro. She said it only looked like a Camaro. So, of course, they dragged Carla in. Uh, Carla, or, uh, sorry, they dragged Kristen in. Carla was supposed to cover her up with a blanket. That never happened. Um, but they were able to get her back home to Port Dalhousie. And, of course, Paul was too excited at this point in time because this was his perfect victim. Paul was too excited to beat Carla. Uh, for three days, Paul and Carla beat, tortured, and raped Kristen French in every way they possibly could on camera. Um, Paul would beat her for being defiant. She was not as compliant as Leslie Mahaffey was, so he would often beat her. She she did have a lot of bruises. Um, she would say no, or she wouldn't say the scripted things that he wanted her to, or she wouldn't say them fast enough. So Pete, Paul did beat her. It's well known. It was all recorded. It was all on the videotapes. Um... Since Kristen wouldn't always follow the script, he would often beat her into submission. Um, despite this, though, Paul was extremely happy with her. He loved having her around. He really liked having Kristen French around. As disgusting as it sounds, he was very, very happy with his acquisition. And he wanted to keep her for a while. Carla was aware of this and she was jealous. She was jealous because this girl was more youthful. She had long, dark hair like Paul's uh, first girlfriend that he had been very much enamored with. Um, she was jealous. But she wouldn't say so. So on the first night, um, they had Carla's chicken. The second night, uh, Kristen wanted to see what would happen. So she asked her kidnappers for McDonald's um, pizza. That was a big thing in 1992. It's kind of gross, but it was a big thing. It was okay. It was like pizza and french fries. But anyway, she asked for that. And she knew it would take about half an hour for him to get there. So she figured she was buying herself some time. Like I said, Kristen was a very smart girl. She figured if she was left alone with Carla, um, she didn't know Carla's name at that point in time, but she figured if she was left alone with her second captor, um, maybe she could persuade her to let her go. And she did. She did try. Paul left Carla with a rubber mallet. And said, you know, if she tries to escape, because um, Chris and French was a good three, four inches taller than Carla. 
um, she figured, he said, you know, if anything, if she tries to do anything, just hit her with this. So, um, she did try to persuade Carla. She said, you know, um, we can run away from here. I know he beats you. You know, we can leave here. We can go somewhere else. No one will ever have to know you're involved. It doesn't matter anyway. He makes you do this, you know, but Carla, of course, wouldn't budge. If Paul was in it, she was in it. And she, it was, it was too, she was in survival mode at this point in time, according to her. She was just too into herself. She could not let this happen. So I will say um, that pictures, autopsy, autopsy pictures showed, this is just a description, guys. I, I've not seen the autopsy pictures. I don't want to. That Kristen had deep bruising beneath her eyes. So probably right about here. She had deep bruising there. And Carla couldn't explain how she got those bruises. Normally she would say, oh, well, Paul beat her. But at this point in time, Carla could not explain how Kristen French got those bruises. And people did wonder if maybe Kristen did get um, free and Carla beat her with the mallet to unconsciousness. No one can say for sure, though. So, of course, she went through more mind-boggling torture humiliation same thing no privacy whatsoever filmed doing everything tortured beaten particularly the second day she wasn't performing the way he wanted her to so she got beaten up quite a bit um and very defiant um they showed her the leslie mahaffey tapes to scare her into further submission and um she was still very defiant, though. She still was very defiant to Paul Bernardo and his demands, even telling him, quote, some things are worth dying for, end quote. Um, now, she had at this point in time also vomited in the um, in the in the closet um, uh, because they had fed her once again, booze and sleeping pills. Um, but they were able to clean up that mess. And on the third night, Kristen said she wanted Swiss chalet. She knew that was quite far too. Um, there's, there's a possibility that on the third night she tried to escape and Carla beat her to death. There is a huge possibility of that. She was making Paul happy. And Paul always said he wanted to keep her for a while. It was Carla that said, no, 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 no. We have to get rid of her, particularly before we have Easter, right? It was Easter weekend, particularly before we go over to my parents' house for Easter. If we don't get rid of her, then, you know, she could try to escape. And Paul said, well, why don't you just cancel at your parents' house to just tell them we're sick. And she's like, no, 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 no. We have to go because that provides us with a perfect alibi just in case we need it. So part of me, actually a huge part of me, believes that Carla Homoka is actually the one that killed Kristen French. Paul seemed too happy with her and he wanted to keep her for quite a bit longer. But regardless, according to Carla, well, we know that on that last night, see... Kristen had called him a bastard, and that's the one name you don't call Paul Bernardo, right? He had very serious issues with that word because he technically was one. His father and mother weren't married, and, and he never knew his father. So he shoved a wine bottle up her. He actually had Carla shove a wine bottle up her rectum, and when she wasn't shoving far enough, he did it himself. He then removed it and raped her again anally and vaginally. And then according to Carla, he um, he wrapped the electrical cord around her and he um, killed her that way. He he suffered, he um, he strangled her. I don't know if there's evidence of strangulation in the autopsy. Um, we'll get into that in, in a little bit. Um, with Leslie Mahaffey, of course, they couldn't tell if she was strangled or not because um, her neck was cut. So they weren't totally sure. Um, she did have indications of not being strangled or there there were some of the indications of strangulation weren't there but it could have been due to the dismemberment um so like i said paul wanted to continue the fun fest carla didn't regardless they did do away with Kristen french and uh then they went to to family dinner at carla's parents home um the two of them cleaned up the whole entire scene um, they burned her clothes, uh, they burned uh, her backpack, all of those type of things. They actually cut all of her hair off 
because they had some indication that there could be traces of their house because she had that really long luxurious hair um so they cut off all of her hair they bathed her body um they made sure to clean out all of the DNA and everything else like that and then they drove her body into Burlington guys and abandoned it on a side road called number one side road which was very close to the cemetery that Leslie Mahaffey was interred at. Um, she wasn't found for a little bit though. She was found by a, a, a scrap iron collector. I think about two weeks after, after she had gone missing. And of course, immediately investigators knew that Kristen French was not a runaway. So immediately they were out looking for her. And because they had that one woman come forward that say, oh, I saw Kristen with these two strangers. So police were pretty sure there were at least two people invo involved. They thought they were two laborers though, two young laborers. They were pretty sure two people were involved and they were pretty, they were certain, according to them, that the car they were looking for was an old beige Camaro. The woman said the headlights looked like a Camaro. It looked like one. She didn't say it was one, but they took that tip and they were off and running. Of course, um, I do also want you guys to know that Kristen's last recorded words were, quote, I don't know how your wife can stand you because, end quote. She was very defiant. She, she, yeah. Sorry, guys. So, Police were still on the were on the hunt at this point in time for this older model beige Camaro. Bernardo himself was feeling pretty cocky, guys, because he didn't drive a Camaro, so it didn't really matter. Although this was despite the fact that he was still a suspect in the Scarborough rapes. He was still a suspect in that. Two women had reported his actual car and license plate to the police for him stalking them. And several of his friends had said that he was a Scarborough rapist. They came forth forward with tips. Um, a lot of people who knew Paul Bernardo said he looked like the Scarborough rapist and several of his friends had also gone to the police and told them about his deviant sexual ways, uh, the way he treated women and the way he treated Carla. Um, and also about other untoward things he had done with girls. But the police, Paul Bernardo was still not on their radar. Radar. Um, and of course, the ladies that made the reports on him, they were never followed up with. Not at all. So, sorry guys, the Green Ribbon Task Force was actually formed May 5th, 1992 to investigate the crimes and um, most suspected that at this point in time, Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French were connected due to the proximity of uh, Kristen French's body to Leslie Mahaffey's grave site. Um, Paul, the reason why Paul dumped Kristen in Burlington was because he was trying to get people off of him. You know, he wanted people to believe that the kidnapper was from Burlington, not Port Dalhousie, not St. Catharines. So police actually came to 57 Bayview Drive in May of 1992. They had received a tip from a person who knew Paul. And knew about how he treated women, knew about um, the abuse that he put on Carla and other girlfriends and that he had raped the girl at the party. So it, it was either Van or his, it was Van. Um, and since Paul, but Paul was never in the system. He was never in the system guys. So no reports would show up on him. He looked clean, even though he was still a suspect in the Scarborough rapes, he hadn't been convicted of anything at this point in time. Um, and I mean, they had numerous tips on him, numerous tips on him from everything from stalking to abuse to, um, money to everything they um, to to even just looking like the Scarborough rapes um, police came they questioned him they looked at his car agreed that his car was a Nissan not a Camaro and didn't look like a Camaro so they cut him loose they said he was no longer a suspect in it they officially cleared him in May of 1992 in July of 1992 police actually released um, a reenactment of Kristen's abduction and of course the main and central star of it was the Camaro. Inspector Vince Bevan was heading the uh, Green Ribbon Task Force and he was insistent that the car they were looking for was a Camaro. So they they released this reenactment of what had happened and Paul watched it and he was like just enthused over the fact that they had so many things wrong. 
Um, the couple actually drove to Disney World um, later that summer so that Carla could see Mickey. She was like a huge fan of all things Disney. She loved all things Disney, uh, particularly Mickey Mouse. Um, and on the way home, they actually stopped in Atlantic City and procured um, a lady of the night, if you will, um, for a threesome. Um, now, Paul didn't get his money's worth. He was unable to get off because the woman wouldn't let him have anal sex with her. And um, she does describe Chris, um, she does describe Carla as being a very willing participant. Everything Paul asked her to, to do, asked her to do, she was like, okie dokie. And she did it and she seemed like she was quite knowledgeable in same-sex relations. Um, although she did remark to Carla that Carla had more bruises on her than this woman did. And this woman was a working girl. It was kind of like, what's up with that? But Carla just, you know, used her standard excuses of work and the dog buddy. Um, so Carla got her money's worth. Paul didn't sex wise, but he did get to watch this woman pee. So it was like a win-win for him, I guess. And then they went home. They did try to actually groom another girl during Christmas season of 1992. This was actually a really good friend of Tammy's. And they tried to groom her, but she was more street smart and more savvy. Um, Paul did manage to, like, put his penis in her once. Like, this girl didn't like to be touched or anything like that. She was street smart. She was savvy. Um, she was more aware than, let's say, um, Tammy Lynn or the other girls were. Um, she, she knew things and Paul did try to like, uh, put his penis in her. He actually did manage to once, but like, she didn't want anything else to do with them. Um, she was just too street smart and too savvy is too savvy anyway. So she, she stayed away from them after that. She was phased out after Christmas time. I think she showed up one more time and she had like a guy friend with her. And of course, Carla was trying to push Paul on her. Paul was trying to push Paul on her, um, but it just never happened. She was like, I don't like you that way. I like you as a friend. So um, she was phased out as well. So at this point in time, even though he already was, Paul was spinning even more out of control. He's beating Carla even more. And I mean, like when I say beating guys, he really was beating his spouse. There's no way around it. As much as As much as I doubt Carla, as much as I dislike Carla, we can't get away from the fact that she really was a beaten um, spouse, um, that she really did still love Paul and that probably, see, that's where it gets hard. It, it could perhaps be that a small part of her compliance was to keep Paul happy. She did want to keep Paul happy, but she wanted to keep Paul happy because she wanted to keep him. She cared about looks as well and she thought he was her everything. Um, I think part of her liked the attention from it too, but I'm not a psychiatrist, so. Um, so like I said, he started to spin out of control. He was even scaring Lori Homoka. He started to talk about some weird theory about looping and he told Lori, you know, if you want somebody killed, I know people who can do that kind of thing. I don't, he was, he was really spinning out of control at this point in time. And over the new year, um, late Christmas season to New Year 1993, he went to Montreal with a group of friends and he actually came back worse than before. And that's where we're going to leave it at this point, guys. We're going to leave the rest of the story until next week. But tell me what you, you think so far. Um, what do you make of the police investigation? What do you make of how police treated Leslie Mahaffey? Um, I mean, they should have still looked for her. She never called home. She didn't follow the pattern that she had the previous two times she had run away. And runaways are still very important people too. They deserved to be looked for. Police should have handled her case much, much better. The media should have too. Regardless, what do you guys think about it? Who do you guys think killed Leslie? Who do you guys think killed Kristen? What do you guys think so far? Let me know in the comments down below and hopefully I'll see you back here next week, guys, for the end part of this story. Bye.